Naples Harbor and passing the Crokes Point jetty off our port side, we head east and settle back for the trip to the wreck site. Let's now take a look at the history of the Bronx Queen. The Bronx Queen was originally built during World War II as the submarine chaser USS SC-635. Submarine chasers were designed by the Navy as small anti-submarine craft that could be constructed in from five to eight weeks on a production basis. Their purpose was to patrol coastal inland waters and to provide protection to fleet anchorages. The SC-635 was built by Mantis Yacht Building Company in Camden, New Jersey. The SC-635 was launched on October 12, 1942 and commissioned on October 23rd of the same year. She was 110 feet long, had a 17-foot beam, displaced 116 tons, had a wood hull, and traveled at a top speed of 21 knots. After World War II ended, the SC-635 was decommissioned and sold. She was then converted into a party fishing boat. On December 20th, 1989, the Bronx Queen was cruising off Breezy Point on her way to begin a day of winter fishing. The day was cold and sea conditions were rough. They were only a few miles offshore when the captain heard a loud thump in the stern. The old wood-held vessel had apparently hit a submerged log and was now taking water rapidly through a hole in her stern. Within 15 minutes, the boat's stern had gone down leaving 19 people clinging to stay aboard her bow, which was still temporarily buoyant. The Coast Guard responded quickly to the distress calls, but due to the rough seas, it took almost two hours to retrieve all passengers and crew from the bitter cold water. Unfortunately, two of the victims died later in the hospital, one from exposure and the other from a heart attack. The Bronx Queen had gone down in an area known as Wreck Valley. On January 6th, less than three weeks after the Bronx Queen went down, I became the first recreational sport diver to descend to the new shipwreck. What I found was the Bronx Queen laying in about 35 feet of water, sitting upright and intact, but listing heavily to her port side. Her pilot house had also been ripped off, apparently during the sinking. The pilot house was nowhere to be seen. The vessel sits on a clean sand bottom and was completely loaded with artifacts. For the next two years, divers have recovered all sorts of interesting artifacts from the old subchaser. They brought up everything from steel fluted anchors, cage lamps and brass portholes, to the bronze letters off her stern. Today the wreck continues to produce a wide variety of artifacts to divers who explore her remains. Over the past two years, the wreck itself has changed dramatically as a result of wire dragging and the area's strong currents. Divers will now find a broken down, low-lying, scattered wreck with her bow section broken off and laying on its port side. A ballast pile of lead bricks can be found just aft of the bow on the starboard side. Her huge diesel engines are the highest relief on the site and are usually surrounded with marine life. Her stern sits upright but has deteriorated drastically and has now been reduced to only her hull planking. You guys ready? After locating the wreck site with the Fox Ride 3's Loran and depth recorder, a marker buoy is dropped. Steve then repositions the boat directly over the wreck site before dropping a grapple hook to snag into the wreckage. Steve will descend first and secure the grapple to the wreck before I jump in with the camera. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Where are you going off, Steve? I'm going off the starboard side. I need a rope to tie us in with. We quickly start to suit up. This site is well known for its ripping two-knot current, but Steve and I have planned today's dive at high slack. 
So hopefully, we will have good visibility and not have to fight the tide. Our objective today will be to film the entire wreck from bow to stern. Then look for artifacts in the debris field off her port side. Since the Bronx Queen sits in only 35 feet of water, we plan for a full two hours of no decompression bottom time. This long bottom time will permit plenty of time for both filming and artifact hunting. It looks like we've timed the dive perfectly. As I descend, I can't help but notice the excellent visibility and lack of current. As I reach the wreck, I see that Steve has secured the Fox Ride 3's grapple into a beam in the wreck's stern. He has tied the grapple into the wreck with a rope so we can't drift away. We immediately swim towards the bow to begin our filming. Navigation on this wreck is fairly easy because the wreck sits in a straight line and has several distinct landmarks. The bow section is easily recognizable and sits on its port side. Her bowsprit is now resting in the sand and a large cleat is still secured to the remains of her deck. Her port side hand railings are also identifiable and are now laying flush with the sand. As we slowly start to make our way astern, Steve locates another cleat. This smaller cleat should make a nice artifact, and Steve starts its salvage by using a pipe wrench to remove the nuts. This artifact, which is still firmly mounted to the wreck, will require more than one working dive for its recovery. But Steve is determined to make some good progress before continuing his exploration of the wreck. A little further astern, and on the starboard side, Steve passes over a ballast pile of lead bricks. Each brick is approximately two feet long and weighs just slightly over 50 pounds. The wreck's diesel engines sit upright and are massive. They must rise a good 12 feet or so off the seafloor. The engine area seems to attract the largest congregation of marine life and everything from bagoles and baitfish to sea pass and some monster blackfish can be observed on almost every dive. The engine area has also always been a productive spot to hunt for artifacts. The vessel's pilot house was located directly over her engines and quite a few nice artifacts can now be found by searching this area. As I'm filming the bait fish surrounding the wreck's engines, Steve has already started his search for artifacts. He finds a likely spot and starts his search by flipping over and removing some loose wreckage. This allows him better access to fit into the hole. He then spots the glimmer of brass deep inside the wreck. After settling down, he wiggles in between the engines and reaches as deep as he can into the wreck. Steve grabs onto and after a little pulling and prying recovers the vessel's intact starboard running light. The running light, which had once been mounted on top of the starboard side of the Bronx Queen's deck house, is in remarkable condition. In fact, the lamp is in such good shape that even the green glass lens is still intact and in place. This is so far one of the nicest artifacts ever to be recovered from this wreck. Just behind the engines is the remains of a trawler's lost fish net. This net is small and tucked under the wreck's hull planks, so it causes little danger to divers or to marine life. On the port side amidships, I spot the remains of a workbench that had once been inside the Bronx Queen's engine room. The bench is now upside down, but still has a bench grinder mounted to it. As we reach the stern, Steve begins again to search for artifacts. 
This time, he quickly locates the remains of a brass cage lamp. The lamp, which had once been mounted on an inside wall of the Bronx Queen, will now be polished and preserved as a shipwreck artifact. Sir. The stern of the Bronx Queen is still sitting upright. This area is very deteriorated and broken down, but divers can still recognize her bronze rudders and rudder shafts. Not too far from where we found the cage lamp, Steve finds a beautiful rectangular brass porthole. This porthole had been mounted to the vessel's engine room. It is also bent and twisted probably as a result of the wire dragging, but it will still polish up to make a fine artifact. Steve swims both the porthole and the cage lamp back to the anchor line, where they will be recovered later. By searching in the debris field off the wreck's port side, I'm rewarded by finding a brass steering pulley. These pulleys were used to route the cable that provided steering to the vessel by connecting the vessel's helm to its rudder. As with most artifacts recovered from this U.S. Navy-built wreck, construction is top quality and heavy duty. Next, I swim towards the stern, still carefully searching the wreck's portside debris field. <laughs> 